In the lush, virgin pine forests of the Louisiana Territory, there once existed a no-man's land. For a century, this narrow strip between the Calcasieu and Sabine rivers had been inhabited by the most notorious international cutthroats and brigands on the face of the earth. In 1806, the United States and Spain agreed to designate this no-man's land the neutral strip, over which no man would have dominion. In 1822, to protect settlers moving west, the U.S. Army established Fort Jessup, 17 miles west of Natchitoches into the strip. Jessup would represent the new western frontier and would become the largest fort in America. Jessup's first commander was Lieutenant Colonel Zachary Taylor, who would be elected 12th President of the United States, whose daughter Sarah would marry Jefferson Davis. The very heart of this neutral strip would become Vernon Parish. In 1839, on the dare of a group of drunken outlaws and river rats, Episcopal Bishop Leonidas Polk entered a brand new, lawless, godless frontier town on the Red River at the edge of the neutral strip and conducted the first religious service ever to be held in notorious Shreveport. In 1861, Bishop Polk, a graduate of West Point, offered his services to the Confederacy. In three short years, the bishop's military daring had become legendary. On June 14, 1864, leading his troops, he died in battle at Marietta, Georgia. General Leonidas Polk is remembered as the fighting bishop. Founded shortly after the Civil War, in the middle of the old neutral strip, the little town was named in honor of the South's most revered leader, General Robert E. Lee. By 1916, the little boom town had matured nicely and boasted a fine new depot. The virgin trees were huge. The lumber companies prospered. There were fine homes, fine families, until the forests were gone. By 1940, the longleaf pine had been clear cut away. The land had the look of a well used battlefield. In 1940, there is the call to war. President Roosevelt authorizes the largest maneuvers in American history in the old neutral strip. In honor of the fighting bishop, the camp is called May 15th, 1940, the great Louisiana maneuvers begin. They fanned out in their World War I uniforms. The attacking Red Army under Major General Walter Kruger, the defending Blue Army under Major General Walter Short. Sonny Berry recalls the 1940 maneuvers. I have several remembrances of, uh, of the early days of Fort Polk. Uh, one, I remember when I was about the third grade, uh, the horse cavalry, they turned out school so we could uh, sit on the edge of the sidewalk and watch the horse cavalry uh, come in from Texas to invade Louisiana. And they passed for a solid 12 hours. Robbie Mock. 
I'm a Georgia cracker. I come out here to Louisiana in 1940. On maneuvers, when we come into Alexandria on the train, and so they decided that they needed a driver to drive in the uh, umpires at night. And I didn't even know the way up Leesville, much less out of where I was going here in Louisiana. A.B. Esnack on the left ran a post office, store, cafe, and had a daughter, Annie, who remembers. When all the troops would come in, and they came by the thousands, I was down close to the Coca-Cola box. It was a flat one then. And, but one of the soldiers said, what kind of soda do you have? And of course, I looked just as blank as I could look. And I turned around and looked on the counter. And I said, arm and hammer. <laughs> And he said, no, soda. And finally, he said, soft drink. Well, I didn't know what soda was. In the South, we called them cold drinks or pop or I want a Coke. <laughs> so I think about that every time I think about maneuvers. I think of what kind of soda do you have? Just across the road was another store. My daddy, much to my mother's chagrin, across the store, uh, the road from the store was a big building over there and he sold beer. Of course, my mama was a big Baptist. She didn't like all that liquor. But anyway, he sold beer and they sold it so fast until they just started throwing the money in pasteboard boxes and just taking their feet and just stamping it down. We'd have to go to Ellick for supplies and that was 28 miles from Flatwoods. And I've known them to go three and four and sometimes five times a day to get supplies. Meanwhile, back at Leesville, the town was overcome with people. Frank Anderson, born 1896, was working for KCS Railroad and had never seen anything quite like it. We had lots of people that hired everybody who ever showed up. I don't care what his name was, as long as he asked him all if he had his fingers and toes, especially on the railroad that did that. The media reported snakes and alligators, pigs in the streets. Once in a while, maybe one got out. But that, that was an exaggeration. Just like we said, snakes and alligators. No such thing as alligators. I've had them soldiers. Asked me, he says, well, says, uh, where's all them alligators? I said, we don't have no alligators in the swamps. I said, we've got a lot of crawfish and catfish, lots of snakes. Well, that's what they've been telling us. This swamp land, where they got surprised out there where they was, well, that's on a hill. The great Louisiana maneuvers had begun with broomsticks for guns, trucks for tanks, horses, mules, airships, and soldiers yelling, bang, you're dead. In seven days, May 22, 1940, the Blue Army is defeated, and Leesville is in the friendly hands of the Red Army. The 16-month series of exercises had begun at a cost of a million dollars a day. Construction began on a permanent camp January 1941. 20,000 workers descended on the tiny community. Laborers at 40 cents an hour, carpenters 75 cents, and truck drivers a dollar an hour. Room and board and three meals cost a dollar and a quarter a day. We had three bedrooms. We had a little bathroom. It was about three by six, three foot by six foot. I don't know how we did it, but we had 11 people living in that house. But we had to in order to have places for people to live. So we had eight, uh, eight ladies staying in our house, for, and it, that lasted for about two years. Camp Polk was completed in 1942 at a cost of $22 million. The second phase of the Louisiana maneuvers covered well over half the state of Louisiana. The Blue and Red Armies were arrayed over 7 million acres. War was declared. The cost had risen from a million dollars a day in 1940 
to $5 million a day in 1941. They built the railroad from Polk to Claiborne, and they had a regular pageant run on it. Two coaches on there, the steam engine, hauling them back and forth, and also they had a freight cars brought there, all the supplies, and they had three bridges across by, they'd blow up the track, and they'd build it back, see how quick they'd build it back, you know. One day, Frank Anderson heard a voice from the rear, which said... This general I was talking about says, uh, could I speak to you? I said, I haven't got time to speak to nobody. You don't know who I am. I said, no, and I don't care much. And he says, uh, this is Eisenhower right back of me. I said, well, I can't even see it. I say, I can't turn the shoes. I got, man, I got the watch down here. This little general come up, pat me on the back, and Eisenhower shook hands with me. And, uh, one of my helpers, Old Doc Walker, he was a character. He says, I thought they were going to put you in the brig. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you were in the Army, you had to look military. The soldiers would um, hire people around there to do their washing and ironing. There were some women out there that ironed with a flat iron now and had to heat it on a wood stove. That was as beautifully done as I've ever seen it, and, but I don't remember how much they charged them. Something like a quarter uniform, I think. They, they had all the business that they could, could do. Robert Murray. We had problems with our launder. We'd send it off to people in Alexander and Pineville, and they'd come out in the field and pick it up, and then you'd be moved. Well, some of them came out there and they had a real good idea. It seemed like he says, hey, I can always find your unit. And I'll get it back to your supply sergeant, whether you own detached service or whatever. And he says, all you do is give me your laundry, and I know I can tell you how much it's going to cost, and you pay me now, and then we'll get you clean laundry back to your uh, supply sergeant. And, hey, that made sense, and we thought it did. It made him a fortune, I guess because they finally found out my clothes didn't come back and other people's clothes didn't come back. And they finally found a warehouse over at Pineville with molded GI clothes in it up to the ceiling. And they never did find the people that had the old panel truck that was had rented the warehouse to store it in, you know. Bess Evans, the lady behind Cary Grant, was senior hostess at Camp Polk and in charge of all dances. On Friday night, we had them in the service club. We had a big service club. We had to have one dance every Friday night. So then I went around to different towns in Louisiana and organized the military maids. The last Saturday night in every month, I had a big dance in the field house. And there was a picture, a painting, that was done, and I can't remember that boy's name, by a boy from New York. And it covered the whole end of the club. We'd have 750 girls, and we'd let in around 1,200 young men. At 9 o'clock, they had to be fed. We danced until 11 o'clock, the dance stopped. The boys would bring 750 cots and fold them up in one end of the field house. When the dance was over, I had to see that every boy was out of there. All I lacked was just a casket when they'd leave. Camp Polk was known for more than famous generals. Bob Hope was there in 42. Cary Grant was there in uh, 43. And I believe Ruth Hussey was there. Irene Manning, she was there in 43. She was a love. And what about Leesville? The tiniest little country town that you have ever been in. Ted Kopecki. 
All Leesville was at that time was just a real army town. The only thing you could do, you could walk up and down the street, look in the stores, and the people, you couldn't even walk in the sidewalk. It was so bad to walk, and if you wanted to do anything, there's only one thing to do, is eat a drink, and they had one little old movie house there, and you'd go in there, and it'd be hot, and that would be long before air conditioning. Frank Word was home on leave from the Navy. I will say that there was a lot of people here. And I could sit on my mama's porch, and if I wanted to spend six hours watching passing Army personnel and vehicles, I could do it. The business was pretty good. We owned a drugstore uh, downtown Leesville, and you, you'd have to let somebody out to let somebody in. It was that full of chock-a-block of customers. Uh, across uh, from the hotel and the drugstore which we owned why, was the uh, Red Hound Bar, and any time you wanted to go in there, you had to be the fifth row if you wanted a hot beer. Honor Field was once a POW camp. It later housed the Women's Army Corps. I remember on Sunday afternoon, my father used to drive uh, my mother and my brother out uh, on old Highway uh, 10, where uh, Honor Field is today, but that was a German prisoner of war camp uh, during World War II. And it housed a great many uh, Italian and uh, German POWs. Well, I was out there when they opened the uh, prison camp. I handled two or three or four German prison trains. And the nicest bunch of people you ever saw. He said, we caused no trouble. You know, in fact, I have an old radio now that one of those lieutenants gave me, German lieutenants. My son's got it in Houston. Lynn Hancock was a dentist. The only wooden buildings we had were, were the mess halls and the latrines and also our medical facilities. And we marched with them, we stayed with them, we gave first aid on the battlefield, just the same as the physicians did. I remember one particular uh, afternoon when it was real hot and we all peeled off the whole battery did. We took off all our clothes and, and uh, we started jumping into the stream and the bayou and, and uh, one of the farmers saw us and he got perturbed about it because we were all nude in front of his wife. And, so he came down the hill with a shotgun, and if you ever saw a bunch of guys get their clothes on, we did real fast, and I'll, I'll never forget that. On Saturday night, it got kind of lively in Eddie's Beer Garden. Didn't have a lot of American beer at that time. During the war, most of the beer they had was imported Mexican beer, and it came in a small bottle. Every Saturday night, they would bring in this thousand, thousand troops and turn them loose. I don't know how they ever got back to their units, but I guess they did. But they chose up and one of them got on the side of uh, where Boudreaux's garage used to be, and they threw these beer bottles back and forth at each other for quite a while. And that's the night they kind of literally took Leesville apart. Well, on uh, Sunday morning, there was nothing to identify anybody's business or any barber poles. They were all down and stacked neatly down to depot. And everybody went down and, uh, and collected their barber pole or their sign and bought it, bought it, uh, bought it back. Glennon Red McKee was very young in 1941. One morning I remember specifically, and these tanks come up and surrounded our house and scared me to death. I didn't know if it was the Germans, Japanese, or what it was. I run for the winter, went out the winter, went to my grandma's and grandpa's, which was about a mile and a half across the pasture, screaming. In 1940, Francis Drake was 19. At that age, probably I, I was interested in the, in the young boys. The Drake family had one of the few telephones in Mitchell. They were an air observation post. And every time we heard planes go over, we had to use this code and call Houston 
One day, I definitely remember, it was on a Saturday, and my mother had gone to Shreveport, and this soldier with a gun came to the back, and he said, you're under arrest. And we said, for what? And he said, because you are in command of, a, of, of an observation post. And we told him that we weren't. We thought he was teasing, so I remember we said, oh, no, you know, you, you're not going to capture us. And he said, oh, yes, I will. I'll show you I can. So he blew his whistle, and from my, every building, there was a barn out here and a little chicken house over here and some trees over here. The soldiers just came out, I mean, all of them with guns, and they literally surrounded the house. I don't recall they didn't really take us anywhere, but I do recall he scared us to death. Every day, a reconnaissance plane would fly over very low. And, and he would fly low enough that we went out and started waving to him. And after that had been going on for several days, we went out one morning and waved, and he came back over, and we saw this little parachute, this little white parachute, slowly come to the ground. And it landed right in our backyard. Hello. This is a funny way to become acquainted, but I would like very much to meet you. Please drop me a card or letter. My address is Lieutenant John W. Williams, Ragley, Louisiana. I will answer it if you will. See you again soon. P.S. Sorry this dirty handkerchief is all I have to wrap this in. Naturally, being a, a young girl, I was interested in correspondence, so I wrote a letter. I had returned back to Northwestern to go to school, and it was, oh, the first or second week of school, and my mother called and said that uh, the commander of this particular group had called her, and they seemed to know who I was, and that this, uh, his name was Johnny Williams, that he wanted to meet me before he was shipped out, and could she bring me to Mansfield, where they were, bivouacked, isn't that what you call it, in the woods outside of Mansfield. So they drove to Natchez and picked me up, only to find out that he had been shipped out the night before. All we know that the whole, I guess, battalion, is that what you call them, the whole group was shipped somewhere and never did hear from him again. I sure would like to know what happened to him. We bought our first new car. It was a Chevrolet, a red one, I'll never forget, and we had a radio in it. We'd never had a radio in a car before, so we got the news of Pearl Harbor being attacked on December 7th. Before we got out of the car, we could see the people on the street selling the newspapers about Pearl Harbor being bombed, and I have those papers today. And we had dinner, came back. Time we got back, the tents were struck at Camp Claiborne, and the train was in, and they were loading them. It was just that quick. Thomas Jefferson Monk was elected to the city council in 1942. Leesville was full of slot machines. Some of them had eight and ten in one joint. You never found a joint with less than three or four. A lot of them would get a beer license, put in four or five slot machines. That's where the income was, on the slot machines. Any problems in city government? No, sir. We'd meet four and five times a week with the Army personnel. They were always griping about something, how it should be run. And Mr. Morris finally told the colonel, you go back out there and run the damn camp, I'll run the town. Raymond Palmer. I had a band down at the... Belvedere Club, and they had fights there every night. And it was just a regular routine. Any time a fight started, the band would immediately stop playing, and we would play the Star Spangled Banner. And of course, all the soldiers who were fighting would hear the Star Spangled Banner being played, and they would stop and stand at attention. A great deal has changed since the Louisiana maneuvers in 1940. The Army lives in high style at Fort Polk. And what remains of that little logging town called Leesville in the old neutral strip? There's the Holly Grove Methodist Church.
founded 1826. Now the oldest Methodist church west of the Mississippi. The old Mitchell Cemetery, first in the parish, boasts graves of two Revolutionary War soldiers and an ex-slave. There's the restored gingerbread bed and breakfast called Huckleberry Inn. Wingate House, designed by the gentleman who designed the old state capital of Louisiana. Ferguson House, now an antique store. In downtown Leesville, behind the courthouse, is Lyons House. And across from the courthouse, the oldest structure in town, the Smart Home. The courthouse itself is well worth the visit. The new Leesville is spread far and wide. At the outskirts of town is the beautiful Anacoco Lake. Next to the Leesville Airport, Vernon Lake. And what fisherman has not heard of Toledo Bend? That cut over land, by the way, is now Kisatchee National Forest with picnic areas and longleaf pine overlooks. Bishop Leonidas Polk would have been proud of his fort. General Robert E. Lee would have been proud of his town. In the words of Ted Kopecki. Those that came out of it oh, feel pretty good. Now I feel real good. At 82 years old, I could I go down to Camp Polk every once in a while and I can just see what, what we went through and what they got now. They got air-conditioned barracks, they've got bowling alleys, they've got uh, every, every kind of amusement they want and the, and the best place to eat and all, but not, not, not in 41. 41, you'd, you'd see somebody, you get in line, there'd be about 300 fellas in line for, for somebody serving beer, and when a man got close enough to buy the beer, he'd buy about a dozen of them if he could carry them. He'd sit in a, under a tree and he'd drink that dozen of beer. It was a great town. I mean, I, I, went, I, loved, I loved every bit of it down there. But you know, after 50 years, uh, you gotta, I, I wanna get down, all I ever wanna do is, if I wanna take a ride, it's only 100 miles, I go to Camp Paul, that's all. It, it, it's just been my life.